welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Marisa Lagos. Coming up on our program, Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti weighs in on what Democrats need to do to stay nationally relevant. And we'll talk about the third time rematch between the Golden State Warriors and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Plus, we get a sneak peek at the Colossal Cluster Fest, a comedy festival in town this weekend. But first, President Donald Trump announced Thursday he would withdraw the U.S. from the Paris Climate Accord, saying this would benefit the American economy. It is time to put Youngstown, Ohio, Detroit, Michigan, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, along with many, many other locations within our great country, before Paris, France. The decision was praised by some pro-business interests and conservative lawmakers. But here in California, Governor Jerry Brown greeted the news with alarm, calling it a misguided and insane course of action. The world is not waiting for Donald Trump. He has given a body blow to the cause of environmental sustainability. But we'll take it and we'll respond. We're on the field of battle and we're going to overcome. That I can promise you. For more perspective on how California is reacting to this, I'm joined now by former Senator Barbara Boxer, who represented California for 24 years and stepped down earlier this year. Thank you so much for joining us, Senator. Of course. So the governor is defiant. I'm curious, as somebody who worked on environmental policies for many years um, at the state and local or, and federal level, how realistic is this defiance? What can California mm -hmm. do right now? Well, I think the people have to be defiant because whatever Donald Trump says, he, he says he's helping Pittsburgh and he's helping Youngstown or whatever he named. He's hurting those places because the entire world, except for Syria, Nicaragua, and I'm embarrassed to say America, is standing together for clean energy, for getting that carbon, that excess carbon out of the atmosphere so that our children are protected so that we don't lose half of our species, so that we don't see people struggling with extreme temperatures, extreme weather, rising seas, storms. Uh, he's not helping the people, Donald Trump. He's just slapped us all in the face, especially our kids. Well, it seems like folks like Governor Brown and really leaders around the state and nation are stepping up and saying, we're going to fill yeah. this void. I mean, do, I guess... Do, um, does Paris need the U.S., or are local and state governments going to be just as good? Look, the Paris Accord was voluntary. That's why this is so ridiculous altogether. It was just an aspirational statement that we all know we're facing a problem, and we're going to do everything in our power you know, to fix it, to reduce the effects of runaway climate change. So what Trump does by leaving it is he's making a statement he could care less but he does not speak for the majority of Americans. And I have to say, good for Jerry Brown. I'm so proud of our great state and other states that are joining with him. Washington State, New York State, there will be others. And when you look at the size of our state, uh, we'd be about the sixth or seventh nation in terms of our gross domestic product. So this isn't a small point. So yes, we need to resist Trump and we need to replace the Republicans in Congress who are absolutely standing in the way of common sense goals, such as making sure that we attack the issue of too much carbon pollution. So you talked about the president sort of um, talking about these cities, but really you think they will be the victims of this yes. decision. Um, and he really cast this as this choice between America and the rest of the world. But I think last year's election results show us that a lot of people do feel like they're being left behind. Um, I know you have a political action committee you're working with. I mean, what do Democrats need to do to capitalize on that message that Trump rode to victory? And can they, really? Right. Well, it's a great question. We took for granted, we Democrats, that people knew we were for them, working people. We've always been for them. We're the party that brought Social Security, Medicare, Obamacare you know, raising the minimum wage. We've always stood with them, sound pensions, good jobs. We made a mistake. We thought as a group that Trump was so impossible, no one would go in that direction. We're paying the price and the people are paying the price. I started this political action committee a long time ago and now I've expanded it. And anyone who wants to know about it should go to barbaraboxer.com. It's free to join. And what we're doing through our very big list, we have about 750,000 people on our list, 
is directing people to those candidates that are fighting against these Trump policies. And this latest slap in the face of America that Trump has done, the self-inflicted wound, by turning us against our allies, by taking American leadership out of the equation on the environment, by saying that scientists don't know what they're talking about, when 98% of them say, we know that human activity is impacting the climate. Right. So he is, uh, he's hurting us, he's embarrassing us, and worse than that, he could be consigning our grandkids to a really difficult life. Well, you talked about targeting um, candidates and, and Congress people that are supporting Trump. I, and I think that there's a lot of chatter about uh, impeachment and other things. There's a lot of criticism coming from Democratic quarters. But it doesn't seem like there's been a strategy completely settled on, on how to push back on him. I mean, what do you think Democrats really need to do to win back the House, but potentially win back the White House in 2020? Well, I think it certainly gets to your other question you asked. You know, are we getting our message out? Mm -hmm. We've got to do better at not taking people for granted at explaining to people we are on their side. If they work for a living, we are fighting for them. If they're women in the workplace, we're fighting for women in the workplace. We're fighting for civil rights. So I think what we need to do is marry the Hillary Clinton message of standing together and the Bernie Sanders message of populism, economic populism. There is no problem between marrying those up. Yes, we stand together and we stand together for all the people and we stand against the polluting special interests. So I think we can do it. And I'm very excited about my political action committee, which I'm volunteering for. I keep saying that because I want people to understand this is from mm -hmm. my heart. We have some great candidates out there, women and men, uh, who are willing to put themselves on the line because somewhere, uh, somehow, uh, we got lost. Hillary got three million more votes than Trump. Right. We should never forget that. But we took certain states for granted we shouldn't have. Quickly, I just want, you mentioned Bernie and Hillary, and, and I know we've seen these schisms within the party, both at the yeah. state and national level. Is that concerning to you? Sure it is. And I've lived through times when we've seen that before. What we have to do is understand that we, we the Democrats, are a very big umbrella. We simply are. And we shouldn't throw people out from under that umbrella. We should embrace them. And we should come together, find the sweet spot where we all agree. And when there's disagreement around the edges, don't turn on one another. The stakes have never been higher. You know, we have a, a president who is doing things that go against the interests of the American people. It's frightening. Standing with tyrants like Putin, uh, it, it, this is unheard of. We've never seen anything like it. So we better unite. We have to unite. And I'm going to do everything that I can to help us unite. It doesn't sound like you're retiring. <laughs> oh, no way. Not at all. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming in, Senator. We really appreciate Thanks. it. It's a pleasure. For the third straight season, LeBron James and Steph Curry go head-to-head -head in the historic 2017 NBA Finals. In 2015, the Golden State Warriors claimed the Larry O'Brien Trophy for themselves. But last season, the Cleveland Cavaliers made a comeback to capture the team's first-ever NBA championship. The long-awaited matchup started Thursday with the Golden State Warriors taking Game 1. KQED's Brian Watt is next. Joining me now are Bay Area News Group sports writer Marcus Thompson and Cavs beat reporter for Cleveland.com and the Plain Dealer, Joe Varden. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So we saw in Game 1 why the Warriors are heavily favored to take it all. But, Joe, I'll ask you first, what can... Cleveland do to get in the competition and come back? I mean, we know they can do it. Right. I mean, the Cavs were awful in game one. For as good as the Warriors looked, for as, as great their talent is with Kevin Durant now on board, the Cavs were abysmal in so many different ways. They, they got a combined three points from four players they rely on, Tristan Thompson, J.R. Smith, Kyle Korver, Darren Williams. That can't happen. 20 turnovers. That's ridiculous. LeBron had eight of them defensively they they're losing Kevin Durant on the court they you just right. those are things that can't how happen. do you lose Kevin Durant right. Right. the guy just the Red Sea parted so many times the guy went straight to the hoop like yeah, un, uncontested yeah Ty Lue said that the Cavs got their coverages backwards so again for as good as the Warriors are they're great but the Cavs were rotten and and they can be better so Marcus you wrote that the Cavs are going to have to play to perfection 
Is that is no it, you stand by that? Absolutely. Uh, this is not last year's Warriors, right? right? Kevin Durant changes everything. They can't. First off, they can't leave LeBron just by himself like that. Where was J.R. Smith? Where, where was Tristan Thompson? He got locked up by Zaza Pachulia. Hmm. By Zaza Pachulia, that's right? right. <laughs> he, that, that's a guy that the Warriors are scared of. Look, maybe it's going to have to be one of those situations where LeBron and Kyrie do something magical to steal a game in Oakland. Right. And then when they get home where, you know, role players tend to play better, now you got J.R. Smith hitting shots. You got Tristan Thompson getting offensive rebounds. You got our, our Richard Jefferson look like he's 22 again. And then you get all that together to win in Cleveland. But they, they can't play like that and have a chance. Mm -hmm. What's the historical significance of these finals? But first off, you could feel it in the arena, yeah. right? That that first quarter was so intense, like like you felt like we're watching history. And and then they do the you know the in between mm -hmm. the timeout game. Nobody's paying attention to like the jumbo trying. Everybody's right. like right. trying to catch their breath because it's that intense. You can feel that we're part of something here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're talking about three MVPs, seven All Stars. Uh, two teams that have been in the finals now three years in a row. That's never happened. I think we'd all agree they're probably heading for a fourth finals next year. So and We've got a guy in LeBron James who's been to seven straight seven NBA straight. finals. Yeah, that Anyone hasn't ever happened done that? Since, since 1966 was the last time that, that anybody Celtics, had done that. Celtics, right? Yeah. Wow. How many Hall, Hall of Famers are there on this in this series? Uh, we might end up with five, five, Hall, yeah. Yeah. five Hall of Famers. So for the, the cities, Oakland, Cleveland, What's at stake for the cities? And in, in, Joe, I'll ask you about Cleveland. Right. I mean, there was a long drought, no championships in anything. You right. won one. Is that enough? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I just from the, from, the sta from the standpoint of, of uh, when you're talking about the, the importance for the cities, Cleveland got what it needed last year. This is not about that now hmm. for the Cavs or for the, the fans in the city at large. This is just about winning again. Mm. Um, th there were historical, there was historical significance last year that, that it's almost hard to fathom when you talk about no championships in five decades. This is just about basketball. You know what can I, you feel that? Oh, yeah, no question. You know what I think this is? This is about two cities that kind of get overlooked becoming elite, right? This, we're past the part of, hey, give us a little bit of do. Now it's like Cleveland, Oakland, like we're, 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 we're with you, L.A., Right, we we can do this every year. We can be in the mix. Right. You're gonna have to consider us great cities, right? And I think that's what's at stake. Cause by the end of all this, whenever this ends in four or five years, right? Whenever LeBron <laughs> retires, there could be three or four championships between these two cities, and that that may, that's the difference between like a one and done. Now you get, now you gotta talk about Cleveland or Oakland, like mm. this is a championship city. I wanted to follow up on that and ask about Oakland proper. It's lost the Raiders, found out it's losing the Raiders yep. this year. The Warriors obviously building a facility in San Francisco. Do these championships mean that much more? I think so. Uh, you know what would, be the, what would be great for Oakland fans? If they won all these championships in Oakland and they went to San Francisco and couldn't win. They'd be like, <laughs> I told you not to leave, right? You should have stayed where it, it was good. Uh, it. <laughs> I think it does matter. Uh, and keep in mind, like the Raiders, you know, are in the mix for Super Bowl you know, they're good enough to, to be in that mix. So if they win a Super Bowl in their last years of Oakland, it's almost like, you know, a, a farewell shot, a, a parting shot. We'll, we'll take care of you on the way out, leave a little money on the dressing. <laughs> Joe, let me ask you about the villainy of the Warriors. Mm -hmm. It's hard for anyone in the Bay Area to see the Warriors as villains, given how long they struggled. Mm -hmm. um, but that's you see stories. The New York Times tried to do a piece. I didn't hear a lot of people say these are straight up villains. Can can these warriors be a different kind of villain? Uh, you know, I used to cover politics. And so I was watching the game last night thinking about Steph Curry's popularity among white suburban moms in Northeast Ohio. If they were going to pull there, his polling numbers would be terrible. He is uh, he is absolutely a villain, um, you know, and it's amazing because I think throughout the country, so many people still embrace the Warriors. Mm. Uh, but in Cleveland, you know, Curry is is very unpopular. They hate that mouthpiece, uh, you know, the the, the <laughs> strut that he that he did after the threes, and you know, adding Durant. I mean, they are they they are to Cleveland uh, in a way what LeBron's Miami teams were. Um, not not to Cleveland, but but elsewhere so throughout like the, the league. Celtics, in Cleveland, yeah. mm. 
LeBron's Miami teams were, you know, certainly en public enemy number one. And when you guys travel to other NBA cities, what is your sense of how the Warriors are really Oh, seen? they they are hated. You know, it's it's odd too because this run started in 2012 and the Warriors were darlings, right? Right. Uh, 2013, they beat Denver. Everybody loved the Warriors. Steph Curry was a sensation. 2014 was the Donald Sterling series. There were so many Warriors jerseys in that arena. And then even on the run, like coming up to the first championship, people loved the Warriors. And then all of a sudden, it went from we love you, they're so cute, like <laughs> <laughs> they're adorable, so to we hate them. <laughs> and it was just like, wow, people really do hate the Warriors. It's, it's really interesting to see it. <laughs> um, are either of you in the business of predictions? We have to be, right? All right, right, let's have it quickly. <laughs> I, I had the Warriors in five from the beginning okay. with the caveat that LeBron might do something ridiculous and win this thing. <laughs> I had the Warriors in seven. I thought the Cavs could win. Um, you know, yeah. they have to play a lot better. All right. Marcus Thompson, sports columnist with the Bay Area News Group. Thanks very much. Joe Varden, thank you. Cavs beat reporter for Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer. Thanks, guys. Thank you. He's a rising star within the Democratic Party. In 2015, Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti was the first to raise the minimum wage of a major U.S. city to $15 an hour. He's also leading the charge for L.A. to host the Olympics again. KQED senior editor of politics and government Scott Schaefer caught up recently with Mayor Garcetti. Mayor Garcetti, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. You know, in some ways for Democrats, this is the best of times and the worst of times. You know, here in California, best of times, uh, all statewide offices held by Dems, two-thirds majorities in both houses of the legislature. And yet, in Washington, not going so well for, for the party and you might say for the country. Uh, what, what does the party need and what does the country need from leaders in the Democratic Party right now? Well, I think the party needs to be less obsessed with an agenda for the Democratic Party and more focused on an agenda for the American people. Um, you know, most people don't live their lives in a partisan way. We might be registered as Democrats, a few of us might even be activists or elected officials, but most people are more concerned with the debt that they have, and more concerned with the public school in their neighborhood. We can't just be a party of opposition, or we'll permanently be a party of opposition. We need to continue as we are in California, having a proactive agenda while we fight defense on those attacks on our values. Does the party need to reposition itself to appeal to these people that you're talking about, working class folks and who are worried about their lives, they're not thinking about party politics? You have to connect. So it's not repositioning, because if you have the wrong messengers or if you can't articulate it well, you can have the best ideas in the world. You can even show them you're a good person. But I think people are hungry for, do you have the guts to take the risk to actually get things done, even if it means pushing back on your own political or personal interests? And Donald Trump, I don't think people would have said, had the greatest heart or the greatest head in terms of the ideas he was putting forward. But a lot of people took a risk because they said, at least he's got the guts. And I think if the Democratic Party doesn't recognize that's what elections are about, at least for president, and then do a lot of the organizing that we got organ out organized on, don't take certain states for granted, continue to register people to vote, don't just look at running the TV ads, but actually put the money into what Howard Dean did with a 50-state strategy. California is setting itself up to be the resistance to the Trump administration and the Trump agenda. Are you saying that either that's not enough or that you know, there's some risk maybe for the party and the state being identified in that way? I don't believe there's a risk. There's only risk if that's all that we do. It is critically important. It is morally necessary to resist and to show that we can persist. But we also have to go further and actually put forward an agenda and show that we're in Los Angeles making the largest municipal utility coal free if we believe that climate change is real and we know it is. If we go to a 750,000 person march for women as we had in LA, the next day we need to help get a, a woman who's a survivor of domestic violence living on a tent on a California sidewalk back into housing and to heal her. There's things every single day that if we are just yelling at our television all day long, we're not doing. Do you think that the election of Donald Trump, who's had no experience uh, in the government or the military, I mean, I think he's the first president to have experience in neither. We see in France, you know, uh, Emmanuel Macron getting elected. He wasn't part of a, a party that was organized before the election. Is, are voters, do you think, looking for something are they open to something, at least, completely different? People are frustrated with the idea you have to build a resume in a particular way, that you have to wait for that moment. But I would flip that on the other side and say experience really does matter. 
I think we're seeing that in the White House. There's a prejudice that what I do is very different than what you do as a journalist or an electrician does or a businesswoman does. Those are professions that you learn and get good at. There are certain skills, but that elected life is just good judgment. You can come in from a, being a CEO and, hey, don't worry, you don't have to sweat the details. You'll figure those out. Government is as highly complex as any of those professions. I'm better at it today than I was yesterday. And I think that we need to make sure that we remind people having some experience really counts. It doesn't have to be in a prescribed way, but you have to know what the Constitution is about, what the courts will say, that there's a bureaucracy, how to work with people in Congress. It's not a top-down kind of job as CEO. You can be a strong leader, but if you can't bring people with you, if you demand it's your way or no way, we're seeing what happens in the White House today. I know that LA is making a push to get the Olympics again. Yes. What's the case for LA? And a lot of cities have dropped out. Well, a lot of cities are smart to drop out because it can be horribly expensive to build the infrastructure, the sports venues, the transportation, et cetera. LA's case is not dissimilar to 1984 when we had the most profitable modern day Olympics showed that a private sector model could get it done turn a profit, invest that back in a city and youth sports and other things that have been the legacy. My emotional pitch was that I was 13 years old in 1984. I went to those closing ceremonies. I watched Carl Lewis and the American 4x100 team set a new world record. And it felt like this amazing moment. The world came to my city, loved Los Angeles, but also saw the America that was good, that could get things done, but that could also stand for everybody being welcome. And what better city than the most diverse city in human history, a place where 39 countries have their largest population outside their home country than L.A. So come on home. Mayor Eric Garcetti, thank you so much for your time. A great pleasure to be with you. Thank you. This weekend, Comedy Central's Colossal Clusterfest premieres in San Francisco. The festival showcases more than 50 comedians, including Jerry Seinfeld and Kevin Hart. There will be music and food and even recreated sets from beloved shows. Ever hear the one about a KQED reporter and the president of Comedy Central walking into a bar? Shiraz Sadiq has the punchline. Kent Alterman, thank you so much for joining us today. For those who don't know, what is the Colossal Clusterfest? Colossal Clusterfest is Comedy Central's uh, first immersive uh, comedy-driven festival. It will take place over three days here in San Francisco. Uh, and we felt like there was nothing like this that existed. Right now we're at a recreation of Patty's Pub, and this is the pub and the set from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and it is an exact replica of the set. Uh, and it's one of three immersive experiences that we have uh, at the festival. So there's this one, uh, there's a South Park activation that's outside, and it basically captures 14 seminal moments from the history of South Park. And then we also have uh, a recreation of Jerry Seinfeld's apartment from the show and a lot of food uh, that's related thematically to that show as well. What are the highlights this weekend? There's an incredible mix of both stand-up comedians from really established stars, you know, like Jerry Seinfeld and Kevin Hart, Sarah Silverman, and it's a mix of people that you would be aware of, but also sort of emerging talent. And then also we have a mix, not just stand-up, but different genres. So we have sketch comedy, uh, improv, we have podcasting here, and then we also have music as well. Comedy has been tackling controversial issues such as race and politics for a long time. What do you think is the role of comedy today in tackling racism and challenging people's stereotypes or perceptions? Good comedy has always been an essential part of society uh, and it's one of the most uh, pure, unfiltered ways that so society has to reflect back on itself. So I think comedy has always served a very uh, important purpose in, in, in our society uh, through the ages. And it goes all the way back to you know, the court jester who was the only person who had permission to speak truth to the king. And with that freedom you know, comes knowledge. Uh, and so I think that no matter what time you're living in, the best comedy and the comedy that really rises above and elevates is comedy that has a very strong point of view and something to say. And I think the times that we're living in, it just continues to heighten you know, the importance of comedy in our culture. Do you think that comedians still have a responsibility to know when a joke has gone too far or when they've crossed the line? Well, I think it's a, it's a very delicate uh, equation. And I think that no comedian will ever know when they cross the line until they cross it, until they get close to it. And I think that uh, it, part of the social contract that we have with comedians is I believe that 
uh, they should have a very unfiltered point of view. And I think the good comedians are very savvy about that because their intention isn't about offending people. Their intention is to try to really go at some truth. It goes all the way back to our own families when you grow up, you know. Uh, Comedy can be born of saying the thing that no one is comfortable enough to, you know, the unspoken thing at the dinner table. And why do we laugh? We're breaking the tension. I mean, that's the essence of what comedy is. So to me, by nature, uh, good comedy often is controversial because it's tapping into potentially uncomfortable truth, whether it's social, cultural, racial, political. For those who don't know, Colossal Clusterfest is only going to be performed in San Francisco. Why did you choose San Francisco as the venue instead of New York or LA? We started looking at different places around the country, back east and the south. We kind of went all over and we pretty quickly settled on San Francisco as a great opportunity and we feel like it really combines the great comedy tradition. Uh, you know, Robin Williams and many others have come through here that have made it really big. And then there's all the history of, uh, you know, the Bill Graham Auditorium. We didn't know when we set out that we would be lucky enough to get this kind of a venue. And the plaza outside, it's just, it's an incredible environment and location. Uh, and once all that came together, we realized that we uh, struck pay dirt. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, what is your favorite Seinfeld episode? Uh, that is a tough question because there's obviously so many great ones, but one that has a special place in my heart is the Soup Nazi episode. <laughs> you didn't get any bread. Just forget it, let it go. <laughs> when I worked on TV Nation, our office was very near the Soup Nazi kitchen uh, when it first opened. What? No soup for you! He was very intense about how you ordered and where you stood and if you kept things moving. And he would refuse service to people who didn't get with the program. And conversely, he would reward people who were really on top of it with extra food. And we used to have a competition, the writers and I, uh, at TV Nation, to see who could come back with the biggest bounty. And people can test their luck with the Soup Nazi because he's going to be here this weekend, right? Correct, yes. The Soup Nazi will be here and he'll be happily insulting anyone who comes by. Kent, thanks so much for taking time to talk with us. Thank you for having me. That's it for tonight. For more of our coverage, go to kqed.org newsroom. I'm Marisa Lagos. Thanks for watching.